Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. And um, two quick notes before we begin. First, and a huge thank you to Becky and Catherine from last week. Wow. I thought, what an amazing God we serve. And uh, wow, that was just amazing. And what an encouragement all it is to all of us to be ready and willing when, when other people ask us to, be, to share our stories because there's such power in what God's doing in people's lives. And then secondly... Because we didn't have a lecture last week, we're going to be covering, here's what we're going to cover today, just so you kind of have an idea. We're covering the verses from Luke on Gethsemane that we studied last week, as well as the rest of the verses in chapter 22 of Luke that we studied this week. And then next week, Holly will cover all of chapter 23, which is she'll primarily talk about the crucifixion, but then she'll also touch on the verses on the trials before Herod and Pilate. Okay, um, just kind of want to let you know the game plan. So in today's lesson, we're going to see one person after another fail Jesus miserably. It's a portrait of unrelenting failure, betrayal, desertion, abuse. Yet at every point, Jesus stands in stark and stunning contrast. In verses 39 through 46, the disciples sleep when they should watch and pray. But Jesus persists in praying for them and refuses to give up on them. Then in verses 47 through 53, we're going to see the horrible betrayal by Judas, as well as the desertion of him by all his disciples. But up to the end, Jesus continues to pursue even Judas, and it's Jesus who's really in complete control. Next, it's Peter's turn to fail. And boy, he fails spectacularly in verses 54 through 62. And he denies his Lord not once, but three times. Yet Jesus' grace infinitely exceeds even Peter's monstrous failure. Finally, in verses 63 through 71, we see blasphemous mocking by the soldiers and horrific injustice by the Sanhedrin towards the sinless Son of God. Yet Jesus patiently endures their abuse and injustice as he triumphantly heads to the cross to die for the sins of the world. Whew. Ladies, I, I tell you what, as Holly said a few weeks ago, we truly are walking on holy ground. And I can tell you right now, I am completely inadequate uh, for this task. So before we dive in, let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we do thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the events that we're going to be looking at today. Lord, please make me and my words disappear. And Lord, we ask, we beg that you would um, speak to each person listening. And Lord, that we would then go out and live out what you're teaching us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before looking at our passage today, I thought let's first br briefly review the events of that momentous week that have been leading up to this uh, time at Gethsemane. On the Sunday before his death, Jesus sat on that young donkey, and you remember he made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and the people were waving palm branches and shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then the following day, Jesus returned to the temple in Jerusalem and he infuriated the religious leaders by cleansing the temple of the corrupt money changers who were fleecing the people and turning God's house of prayer into a den of thieves. After spending the night on the Mount of Olives, Jesus and his disciples returned to Jerusalem on Wednesday for one final day of teaching, as well as confronting the combative religious leaders in the temple. Finally, on Thursday, Jesus spent a private day with his disciples, teaching, pouring himself into them. Their day culminated in the Last Supper, where Jesus and his disciples celebrated their final official Passover, as well as uh, Jesus inaugurated the Lord's Supper, where he explained that the bread represented his body and the blood, and, excuse me, and the wine his blood that would be poured out for many. And remember, it was also at the Last Supper where Jesus exposed Judas as the betrayer. Tragically, Judas would go out into the darkness to make final plans with the religious leaders for the arrest of God's son. 
That same night, Jesus also warned Peter that Satan had demanded to sift him like wheat. But Jesus assured him that he had prayed Peter's faith wouldn't fail. And when he turned again to strengthen his brothers. True to form, good old Peter. I love Peter. He confidently insists he is ready to go with Jesus to prison and to death. And even if everybody else falls away, he won't. The Lord quickly responds, however, that the rooster wouldn't crow that day until Peter denied knowing Jesus three times. Well, it's now late Thursday night or shortly after midnight on Friday morning when we pick up in Luke 22, verse 39. Jesus left the upper room and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. We know from the other gospels that the place that they headed to on the Mount of Olives was a garden that they frequented named Gethsemane. And it's in Gethsemane that Jesus' intense suffering begins. The garden couldn't have been more aptly named because in Aramaic, Gethsemane means olive press. Olive orchards typically had a press where the, the harvested olives would be rolled over and crushed to a pulp by heavy stone, thus extracting the oil from the pulp. That's, when Je- that's exactly what Jesus was enduring in his own olive press as he began to anticipate drinking the cup of God's righteous wrath against sin and bearing the weight of all sin for all time. Jesus immediately exhorts his disciples to pray. He fully understands the agony and fear and confusion that lays before them. And he urges them to pray that you may not enter into temptation. But look at his compassion. Even as Jesus faces horrors far beyond anything we could ever imagine, he's concerned for his disciples. And he's warning them again and again to pray and to keep praying to pray against temptation. Just as Jesus would prepare himself through prayer, so also the disciples needed to pray. Let me ask you something. If even Christ wouldn't face temptation without prayer, how much more do we need to do likewise? When have you prayed specifically that God would help you when that moment of temptation hits? As we'll see with Peter and the disciples, we never know when that moment's going to strike. And sometimes it's too late to start praying in the moment of crisis. Instead, we need to pray before temptation hits so we'll be armored up and ready when the crucial time arrives. Moreover, how about avoiding temptation in the first place? Will you make it a daily habit to specifically pray as Jesus directs us in the Lord's Prayer? that God would lead you away from and not into temptation, to pray that daily. But when those unexpected temptations do suddenly strike, might our very first response be to pray. Ask God in that moment, Lord, would you give me strength right now to run from this temptation and to run to you? He promises us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Clearly, the disciples failed to heed Jesus' warning here. And we're going to come back to them in a few minutes. But for now, let's look at Jesus, which is always the best thing to do, isn't it? After exhorting his disciples to pray, verses 41 through 46 tell us that he withdrew from them them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly in his sweat, became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. We know from the other gospel accounts that his suffering is unfathomably intense. Intense. 
the Gospels use words like deeply distressed and troubled, and they're translated, they mean to be overcome with horror. When they entered the garden, Jesus began to anticipate the unimaginable horrors that he would soon be confronting. And it was so terrible that it shocked and overwhelmed even the Son of God. As God, Jesus fully understood that that he'd suffer and die for our sins. But as a man, he begins to taste how unspeakably dreadful that experience will be. But make no mistake, it wasn't the physical suffering that tormented Jesus, awful as that would be. No, it was the cosmic spiritual suffering that he'd have to endure. We always focus on the physical horrors of the crucifixion, and there are many. But that terrible physical suffering pales into nothingness compared to the spiritual hell that Christ would have to enter. The spiritual suffering of the unimaginable weight of that sin crushing one who had never sinned. Spiritual suffering of the traumatic separation and alienation from his heavenly father with whom Jesus had enjoyed unbroken, joyful fellowship for all of eternity. Spiritual suffering of the awful abandonment by his father because he couldn't be in the presence of all that sin. Spiritual suffering of drinking the cup of God's divine righteous wrath against sin. James Edwards put it this way, the physical anguish and pain of the cross was not what concerned his soul. He was, it was knowing that he'd be abandoned by and separated from his father as he answered for every sin and crime and act of malice and injury and cowardice and evil in the world. In Gethsemane, Jesus suffered just a fine, tiny foretaste of that hell and horror that was just infinitely beyond anything we can imagine. Look at Jesus' anguish but also listen to him. He not only exhorts his disciples to pray, but he prays earnestly, falling to the ground and begging his Abba, his heavenly daddy, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus isn't unwilling to obey. No, no, no. But as the sinless, holy son of God, Jesus recoiled at the thought of bearing sin, guilt, judgment, wrath. We can't begin to imagine it because as John MacArthur explained, believers struggle to abandon sin and embrace holiness. But Jesus struggled to set aside holiness and embrace sin bearing. He wasn't fighting against sinful impulses to become holy but against holy impulses to allow himself to be made sin for believers. Satan tempts Christians to cling to sin. sin. He tempted Jesus to cling to holiness. No wonder, therefore, the anguished cry of the beloved son to his daddy, please, is there any other way? How could the father not answer that plea from the one that he loves so intimately, so infinitely. I thought about it, how could any parent? But I'll tell you how. Because our heavenly father so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved by him. John three sixteen and 17. And ladies, put your name in that verse. For God so loved you, Elizabeth, Nancy, Sharon, that he gave his only son, that when you believe in him, you will not perish, but have eternal life. If you ever doubt the unimaginable love that God has for you, Look at Jesus in that garden and see a heavenly father who loves you so much that he would do the absolute worst thing in the history of the cosmos to his beloved son in order to redeem you and bring you to heaven to be with him forever.
Ladies, it should change us every single day of our lives as we ponder such astounding love, such extraordinary sacrifice, such amazing grace. You are that loved by your heavenly Father. And you're also infinitely loved and cherished by the Savior because Jesus immediately yields in complete and trusting submission to his Father's will. For Jesus to say, not my will, but yours be done, was to fully embrace all that that, that he had prepared for and all that he had told his disciples about. Jesus knew something that we often forget, that his father had infinitely good reasons as to why he would not and could not answer Jesus' supplication in the way he asked. Our very salvation hung in the balance. If God had answered his prayer and Jesus failed to go to the cross, we would have forfeited forever any hope of heaven and eternal life. And ladies, what a lesson when it comes to our prayers. If we knew all that God knows, we would always choose his plan and will, not ours. So when we pray and the answer is no or not yet, We can trust, we can know that our Heavenly Father, our Abba, who is in absolute control, loves us infinitely, knows us intimately, will always, always give what is ultimately best for us and for his glory. I love Tim Keller's words. So often, if God seems to be unconsciously delaying his grace and committing malpractice in our life, Anybody ever felt like that? Committing malpractice in our life, it's because there is some crucial information that we don't yet have, some essential variable that's unavailable to us. When I look at the delays of God in my own life, I realize that a great deal of my consternation has been rooted in arrogance. I complain to Jesus, okay, you're the eternal son of God. You've lived for all eternity. You created the universe. But, but why would you know any better than I do how my life should be going? <laughs> Jesus is the ultimate parent who has you by the hand, and he will bring you through the darkest night. You know, when I read that, I thought, why on earth would we ever want to circumvent the plans, doubt the ways, or hurry the timing of a Savior who is this powerful, this loving, this caring, this wise, this compassionate. So let's pray. Let's pray against temptation. Let's pray for our families, for our friends, for our nation, for our church, for revival, for God's will to be done in all its fullness and glory. Let's pray for helping and and healing and holiness. And let's keep praying and trusting that our Heavenly Father knows best and he will always do best. Because remember, this is important, our faith is not in prayer. Our faith is in Almighty God, the one to whom we pray. It is God who achieves an answer to our prayer. When we speak of the power of prayer, we're referring to the vehicle that God has opened up to us in Christ, whereby we hold firmly to the things we confess and come boldly to his throne of grace to find mercy and help in time of need. Our faith is not in prayer itself. Our faith is in our Heavenly Father. And if, as earthly parents, we know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more Will our Heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? And we can trust, as Alistair Begg says, that God will always give the right thing at the right time, no matter how wrong it might seem in the experience of it. It's what he did at Gethsemane in answer to Jesus' prayer, and at Calvary, and in the empty tomb. And he's going to do it in our lives as well. If we'll pray, but then trust him with the results. In response to Jesus' prayer, though, God sent an angel to strengthen him. 
Now notice the angel doesn't clear away the agonizing obstacle, but instead imparts endurance and strength for Jesus to persevere through the obstacle. Nor does the angel's strengthening bring immediate relief from the trial. Rather, Jesus experiences even more anguish that prompts increasing intensity in his prayers, such that his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. But in the end, he arose fortified, determined, and fully prepared to drink the full cup of God's wrath and go to the cross to bear the penalty we deserved by dying in our place for our sins. Praise God that Jesus prayed and persevered. But what about the disciples? They slept. (laughs) Jesus exhorted them to pray against temptation, but they slept. While Jesus agonized in prayer, they slept. In fact, the other three gospels reveal that three times Jesus returns to find them sleeping, despite his urgent and repeated calls for them to pray. What a contrast. The relentlessly faithful and prayerful Savior and the continually failing sleeping disciples. And remember Peter? Just minutes earlier, he'd been so full of pride and self-confidence that he'd vow he'd never fall away, never deny Jesus. Yet even Peter can't stay awake for an hour. What failures? Can you imagine? Well, actually, I can because all too often that's me. (laughs) So how does Jesus respond to all this failure? Does he blast them? Does he give up on them? Does he walk away figuring... These guys are never going to get it. They're just not worth it. No. Jesus gently rebukes them and yet again urges them, rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. I thought, it's incredible. (laughs) Here at the darkest moment of his life, the disciples let Jesus down big time, and they do it repeatedly. Yet he offers them not condemnation but grace. Instead of giving up on them, he gives them grace to try again. Hallelujah, what a Savior. (laughs) How I need that encouragement and grace because haven't we all been there? I'll never do that again, we vow. I'll never respond in that selfish way again. I'll never, you fill in the blank. Whether it's an addiction or a sinful habit you can't lick or gossip or selfishness, or envy, or chronic worry. It's that sin that you know is wrong and you hate, but yet you keep failing. And you figure, I'm done. Or maybe it's your loved one who you assume, they're just simply beyond all hope. Look at the disciples and be encouraged. These were real men, just like us, and they failed repeatedly, just like us. But just as Jesus did with the disciples, so he comes to us and says, okay, you messed up, but let's try again. Because with Jesus, failure is never final nor fatal. And we're going to see this again and again through this passage. Because as soon as Jesus rises, even as he's still speaking to his disciples, we're told beginning in verse 47, that there came a crowd and the man named Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the son of man with a kiss? Luke, notice he immediately reminds us who Judas was, one of the 12 disciples who had been with Jesus all three years of his ministry. Day in and day out, Judas had heard Jesus' teaching, witnessed his miracles, shared close fellowship, food, laughter with Jesus and the other 11. Judas even held the trusted position of treasurer for the group as he was responsible for the money bag. Yet Judas, who'd enjoyed the stunning privilege of daily walking with Jesus, betrayed him. Don't you wonder how it happened? We know from the Gospels that Judas was apparently stealing from the money bag. Remarkably, though, you remember at the Last Supper when Jesus revealed that one of the disciples would betray him, none of the other 11 realized it was Judas. That's how well Judas hypocritically hid 
his treachery, his dishonesty, his pride. Perhaps it all began with a series of little compromises, seemingly insignificant little sins like so-called little white lies, there's no such thing, (laughs) or taking little amounts out of the money bag or cutting corners in his obedience. We don't know exactly, but clearly nobody starts out in life intending to be a traitor. But it gradually, inexorably happens by making one small sinful choice after another, after another. What a warning that we must never trifle with sin. It's been often said that sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. What seemingly insignificant sins have you allowed to fester in your life? What sinful attitudes of pride or envy or ingratitude might be lurking in your heart? Sin flourishes in the dark, but bringing sin out into the light of repentance brings cleansing and healing. I will never forget hearing the words of Charles Spurgeon that he said, when tempted to sin, we need to tell ourselves, if Christ has died for me, I cannot trifle with the evil that killed my best friend. Today, will you go to the Lord to confess those sinful attitudes or actions or thoughts and ask him to enable you by the power of the Holy Spirit to walk with him in obedience and faith? Yet as Judas betrays him, notice the grace even behind Jesus' question. Are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Jesus' use of that phrase, Son of Man, would remind Judas of what he's doing. He's not simply betraying a human friend, which would be bad enough. But far worse, he's betraying the Son of God, the Messiah. He's about to betray the only one who can grant him forgiveness for his sins, eternal life, and hope in this life and the next. Jesus reaches out to Judas one more time, trying to help Judas see the monstrous sin he's about to commit and giving him one last opportunity to stop, repent, before it's too late. Tragically, Judas wastes that opportunity. He commits the most horrendous act of betrayal in history by betraying his Messiah with the kiss of friendship. Judas will later end his life overwhelmed with despair and remorse, but sadly, never with repentance. Judas, however, isn't the only one with a reprehensible behavior at the time of Jesus' arrest. The disciples also do their share of failing here. Verse 40 tells us, When those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Now we know from the other gospels that good old Peter was the one who brashly drew his sword in a failed attempt to defend Jesus. Now on one hand, you got to admire Peter's loyal courage to try to do something to protect the one that he loved so dearly. But on the other hand, How foolish was this? Peter could have gotten them all killed. After all, Judas brought an enormous mob, an armed mob of trained soldiers and religious officials with him. And Christ's kingdom wasn't a worldly one. And and the disciples knew this. So his followers needed never to fight to protect him. And think of the miraculous power that Jesus had demonstrated again and again. He was only going to be arrested if he chose to permit them to arrest him. Once again, immediately after Peter's foolhardy attempt at armed resistance, we see Jesus in shining contrast. He immediately heals the ear, revealing not only his supernatural power, but also his tender compassion for the servant as well as his loving protection of the disciples who surely would have been killed in the melee. Yet, what happens right after that? The other Gospels add the detail that the disciples, Jesus' loyal and most intimate followers, they all fled. So there's Jesus, 
all alone to face an armed mob led by a traitorous friend. Jesus, however, is the one in majestic and complete control. He confronts the belligerent horde, calmly declaring, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But now is your hour and the power of darkness. One pastor described it as masterful serenity. I love that. Jesus is corrupted. The disciples confused and fearful. Jesus' enemies confounded and vengeful. But Jesus is completely composed. He essentially asked, Did you really need to show up after dark with all this show of force? After all, I've been teaching every day in the temple. You could have arrested me anytime. Jesus, of course, already knows their answer. They needed that cover of darkness to hide their reprehensible behavior and their illegitimate arrest and to prevent the people from rioting and protest. So Jesus lays the truth out there. He's allowing them to arrest him because this is their hour. This is all according to God's time and timetable and plan as the hour when darkness will reign. But make no mistake, through it all and over it all, Jesus reigns supreme while surrendering himself into the hands of sinners and willingly drink the cup of suffering and sin that sinners like like us, so that we could be redeemed. After Jesus' arrest, the the scene's going to shift again. Beginning in verse 54, we're told that the armed mob seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter followed at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. We all know the story. Peter followed at a distance and eventually denied knowing Jesus, not once, but three times. But can I admit something? (laughs) For years, and this is the truth, I slammed Peter for following at a distance. No wonder he denied Jesus, I thought. We're supposed to stay close to him, but when we follow at a distance, we're in danger of falling to temptation and disobedience like Peter. And that's true. But here's the thing. Where are the other disciples? Oh, we know from John's gospel that at some point John shows up because he's the one that helps Peter get inside the courtyard. But what about all the rest of the guys? They all fled in fear for their lives. They were probably all hiding out somewhere, overwhelmed with despair, certain that this couldn't be part of God's plan. All except Peter. There he is, following Yeah, yeah, we know how badly he eventually messes up, but can't we at least give him enormous credit for being there? For earlier trying, even if foolishly, to defend his Lord? For loving Jesus so much that he was willing at enormous risk to loyally follow at a distance and not abandon his master in the most frightening of circumstances? Before we start throwing stones at Peter, maybe we need to ask ourselves, when have we followed Jesus at a distance? Or maybe even failed to follow him at all? So, in the early morning darkness of that terrible Friday, Peter faithfully followed at a distance and sat down by the fire in the courtyard while Jesus endured illegal abuse and mistreatment inside first Annas' house, who was the former high priest, and then in Caiaphas' house, the current high priest. You know the sorry tale of what happens. First, a mere servant girl looks at Peter saying, this man also is with him. He immediately counters, woman, I don't know him. Did you ask yourself, why didn't Peter leave then? What kept him at that fire after that first denial? I don't know, but I wonder if he was inwardly excoriating himself, perhaps thinking, I am never doing that again. If anyone else asks me, I'll never deny my Lord again. And then, just a little bit later, another person declares, you also are one of them. Peter bursts out, man, I am not. Finally, the nail in the coffin of Peter's self-confidence occurs when yet a third person claims Certainly, this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. 
But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And apparently this third denial included an oath. Such was the forcefulness of Peter's denial. Peter's fear and his instinct for self-preservation won out over his love and loyalty for Jesus. But what a powerful, unforgettable moment Luke then records in verses 60 through 62. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Wow. I thought, what do you think was in that look that Jesus gave Peter? Condemnation? Disgust? Frustration? I don't think so. Remember the story that Jesus told about the prodigal son? We, we, we studied it a little while back. How that prodigal rudely demanded his share from his father and then wasted it all in wild prodigal living. When he finally returned home absolutely destitute, that prodigal deserved nothing from his father. But instead... He got everything. His dad threw a party and welcomed him home with joy and love and forgiveness. And that story infuriated the legalistic Pharisees. But oh, how the folks listening who knew they were lost or lonely or left out, they love that story and they love Jesus. I dare say The look that Jesus gave Peter that dark night was one of compassion, love, grace. Because that's the Savior we love and serve. His grace is infinitely greater than all our sin. We, too, deserve nothing. Yet when Christ bore our sins on the cross and took the punishment we deserve for our sins, we received everything His righteousness, his love, his grace, his forgiveness, his salvation, his gift of eternal life. No wonder Peter went out and wept bitterly. That look of compassionate love broke his heart. As Romans 2, 4 says, God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Peter wept tears of sorrow, but also tears of repentance. But don't you know He never, ever forgot that dark night of his greatest failure. Surely that night was what finally broke the self-assured cocky Peter, and it changed him forever. Because when we see Peter later in the book of Acts, he's out there powerfully preaching to the masses, bold and unafraid. He truly is the rock. Well, what changed him so dramatically? Jesus' cross and resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit, of course. But also, God surely used that terrible night of failure in Peter's life as well. From then on, Peter fully understood his own weakness, how prone he was to temptation, and how he'd have to rely fully on Christ's strength and provision. Like Peter... We've got to recognize we are sinners. But then when we fail, we hand those failures to God. Because as with Peter, your failure is never final nor fatal. If you'll repent, turn to God in dependence and trust, and then by the power of the Holy Spirit, try again. God oftentimes allows his children to be emptied that we might be filled, to be broken in order that we might be made strong, and to weep in order that we might know the true joy of forgiveness. Peter fails, but Christ's forgiveness and compassionate love, boy, they just shine like a star glittering in in an inky black sky. And when we fail, if we'll turn in repentance and trust to the Savior, we too will experience the tender love and forgiveness of our glorious Lord. And in turn, 
God can use even those worst failures in our lives for our ultimate good and his greater glory. Finally and briefly, in verses 63 through 71, we see the enemies of Jesus savagely enjoying their hour of darkness as the soldiers brutally mock him and then the Sanhedrin illegally condemns him. It is painful to read, isn't it? To see the sinless son of God who adored little children, who healed the masses, who taught and shared God's love and truth, yet in return... He suffers horrific, sadistic treatment. The soldiers, were told, beginning in verse 63, were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept demanding, prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. Everything about Jesus' various trials and treatments was illegal and utterly unjust. He hasn't been declared guilty, and yet these soldiers were allowed to mock and abuse him. Yet, all this fulfilled exactly what Jesus had told his followers would occur. For instance, in Matthew 20, 18 and 19, Jesus told them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And he will be raised on the third day. Isn't it remarkable? Even as they mock Jesus as a phony prophet, their very actions fulfill precisely Jesus' words of prophecy. All he said came true. And all he says will happen in the future will come true as well. What an encouraging reminder that we can depend upon the solid, unchanging, unbreakable word of God. It's hard to imagine the arrogance, R.C. Sproul writes, that led these soldiers to blaspheme, to mock, and to strike the Christ, the anointed one, the Son of God incarnate. But it testifies to the humility and humbling that our Savior was willing to undergo for the sake of his people that he was willing to endure such horrific, degrading treatment and suffering for us reveals there is no pit too deep that Christ's love is not infinitely deeper still. None of us can ever claim that Jesus doesn't understand our pain and suffering because he endured far worse than anything we're going to ever have to endure. Why? Why? Because he not only unjust, unjustly suffered all this pain and mistreatment and abuse, but he who was the sinless son of God also carried the weight of all our sin for all time. He took our place on the cross and bore God's just punishment for our sin. Jesus understands your loneliness, your sorrow, your pain, your sickness, your fear. Because Jesus was willing to be abandoned by his heavenly father because of our sin, we know we will never be abandoned by God, not even for a moment. Then there was a so-called trial before the Sanhedrin in verses 66 through 71. This followed the two ridiculous and illegal trials before Annas and Caiaphas, These men weren't looking for the truth. They were desperately trying to figure out how to condemn an innocent man who was also the son of God. So they demand, if you're the Christ, tell us. Jesus responds, however, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the son of man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Jesus knows full well they aren't interested in truth, fairness, or justice. But his claim to be the son of God was truth. So he reaffirms his identity with these words about the son of man seated at the right hand of the power of God. That's the designation for Messiah that every Jew knew and recognized from the Old Testament book of Daniel. Finally, a moment later in response to their question, are you the son of God then? Jesus calmly answers affirmatively that you say that I am. That was all the St. Hindred needed. These religious leaders proceed to illegally condemn their sinless Messiah. Yet how ironic 
that in judging him, they're actually the ones being judged. In condemning him, they actually condemn themselves. All the cruel, sadistic, mocking, spitting, punching, flogging, crucifying, only fulfill the very words of Christ. They further the plan of Almighty God, and they ultimately play a part in Jesus' finishing the work of salvation. Once again, men had done their worst, but Christ only shined brighter and more gloriously as he headed triumphantly to the cross for their sake and ours. Over and over again throughout this passage and throughout all of Passion Week, we see the unrelenting failure of men contrasted with the unstoppable love, forgiveness, compassion, and glory of Christ. The disciples slept, but Jesus prayed and never gave up on them. Judas betrayed, but Jesus continued to pursue even the worst of sinners, including us. Peter denied, denied him, but Jesus' grace infinitely exceeds Peter's failure and ours. And the soldiers mocked while the Sanhedrin condemned. But Jesus patiently endured the most horrific abuse to triumphantly head to the cross for their sake and for ours. I don't care what you've done or how you failed. Jesus' forgiveness and love are infinitely greater and deeper. But you must choose to come to him in repentance and faith, asking him to forgive you and to enable you by the power of his Holy Spirit to turn from your sins and follow and obey him. And ladies, if you're enduring particularly hard, dark days right now, remember, God is always fulfilling his plan, keeping his promises, and saving his people. If he did it at the absolute darkest moment of human history, he will do it again today, tomorrow, and forever, until he returns in glory. And then every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. I don't know when he's coming back, but I know he's coming. And I know we don't want to be sleeping We don't ever want to betray or deny him. We don't want to fail him. But when we do fail, let's run to Jesus, humble ourselves in repentance, and move forward in faith and dependence on the beautiful, loving, compassionate, forgiving, powerful, kind, mighty one who died for us. And let's close in prayer. And and y'all, as we close, I just wanted to briefly read the words to a hymn um, that the the title of this um, lecture is from. And I hope that you will think about these words as we pray and over the coming weeks. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless we. Spotless lamb of God was he. Full atonement, can it be? Hallelujah. What a savior. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven, exalted high. Alleluia, what a savior. When he comes, our glorious king, all his ransom home to bring, then anew this song we'll sing. Hallelujah, what a savior. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. There are no words, but we thank you and praise you for coming for bearing our sin, dying in our place, and giving us eternal life. If there is one person listening that has never come to you as her Savior, might this be the time. And Lord, for every one of us, when we fail as we will, thank you that you love to restore failures. Help us to come to you in repentance and faith, and then to go out and live to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.